Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. I am pleased today to share the program with Linda Tannenbaum of the Open Medicine Foundation. She is in Los Angeles and I'm speaking to her from my home in Rhode Island. Hello, Linda. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. The new way of it's, it's a great pleasure. You have worked for many years raising money for research for myalgic encephalomyelitis, which we'll refer to as ME. Uh, when did you start and why? Well, I started uh, originally in 2010, actually, and our daughter was sick and got, came down with this suddenly in 2006. And, and she was pretty severe. She was bedridden and, uh, for a couple of years. And as she was going through this, we basically found out that there wasn't any research being hap happening and researchers were not talking to each other. Doctors had no idea what was wrong with her and there weren't even doctors to visit and doctors needed to be educated. And we realized that if something was ever gonna happen to make her well, we would have to do something and step up to, to help try to find a treatment, try to find a cure for this. And, and uh, decided that once she got better and I wasn't her caregiver anymore, that I would go out and start a foundation to raise money and bring some researchers together. And it kind of kept us going while she was in bed to kind of know and, and assume that she was going to be able to get out of bed and, and we would all be able to go on with our lives and I'd be able to start this foundation. And wonderful uh, happened uh, after uh, a while. She was able to get a little bit uh, farther out of bed and, and uh, start living her life after a few years. And, and in 2010, um, I was not her caregiver and I was able to start a foundation and, and, uh, and then started a second foundation in 2012, which is Open Medicine Foundation to really take our effort global. How is she now? Your daughter? Uh, will... Yeah, thank you for asking. She's actually doing quite well. Um, she has her setbacks sometimes, but she's doing very well, uh, and she's able to live her life and went back to school and went back to college, and she's doing very well, which allows me to continue doing what I'm doing. And how is what you're doing going? Well, it's, um, you know, we all, we all want a cure and a treatment, and so the frustration and the answer is we're not there yet. However, um, there's been a lot of progress in the last few years. And so we have really grown it and, um, and really brought many, many researchers into the fold that are looking at this. There's over a hundred in our working groups now that work together and talk to each other and collaborate. And, and we are so many more people talking about this and sharing results. And, and our goal is open collaboration. So that way, if people are part of our team, they have to share results with each other and share what they're doing. And, and to really escalate this and scale this up to uh, be able to find a diagnostic and a treatment and a cure, hopefully. How does the Open Medicine Foundation work, Linda? Uh, if I send you money, what is the path from you, from me to you to the research? That's a very good question. Um, well, once you uh, donate to us, um, we have a scientific advisory board of 18 top scientists, researchers, and clinicians as part of our scientific advisory board. And we have a uh, director, Dr. Ron Davis. He's the director of our scientific advisory board. And, and we have an executive committee of our scientific advisory board made up of scientists and researchers. And we fund through four collaborative research centers, MECFS collaborative research centers that we've established. We have one at Stanford, we have one at Harvard, uh, Mass General Hospital and the Harvard uh, affiliated hospitals at the medical center and uh, at uh, Uppsala in Sweden and at University of Montreal. And we have, we fund through those centers and the money that comes in is decided amongst the scientific advisory board where, uh, where the funds should go as far as what research projects are most important and uh, what they're doing at the centers is the central uh, way of funding. So we fund through the centers and there's directors at each of the centers that, uh, that run the centers. And, uh, I noticed in a speech that David Sistrom from 
uh, Harvard General, um, from, from Massachusetts General, uh, affiliated with the whole Harvard uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, thanked your organization and Solve ME CFS, another and similar organization. How do you work together? How do the how do the fundraisers in the field collaborate and direct the money, say, to David Sistrom, which was a case in point, and for viewers who are not familiar with that name, he, he has done a lot of studies of uh, <clears throat> exercise intolerance. Yes, he's done some fabulous work, and, and, uh, and so we're really excited that we were able to help fund his research, and uh, in fact, we, we're funding uh, a couple projects with him. Um, but basically, he needs funding for his projects, and uh, Solve CFS funded uh, his projects, and then we also gave him money. So, so uh, we he's doing a uh, clinical trial on mestinin right now, and uh, and that uh, uh, Solve has given some money that he's requested some funding, and they have funded some of what he's doing, and we have two to escalate it uh, so that he could get it done. And we've also, uh, Open Medicine Foundation have funded, he's been collecting samples over three years of MECFS patients uh, that he has done invasive um, CPET testing on. And so we are gonna be testing those samples and we're funding a large project for proteomics and metabolomics for him. And of, for the these, of, these research, of these research centers in various countries, various universities, hospitals, etc. Uh, which one do you feel is the furthest forward? Uh, which one is the closest to some kind of breakthrough? Is more exciting work being done in one place or another? Well, it, it's, it's a difficult question because they all do different things and then collaborate together. So Stanford has, I, we've been funding Stanford since 2014. And so they've developed a, a, a team of researchers that are working there that we help fund. Um, and uh, they're looking for diagnostic tools and they're looking at the molecular basis of MECFS and we, we funded that it really needed to be done for all the basics of what's going on at the molecular basis and uh, and then with Harvard Harvard is more clinical focused and so Harvard we started funding about a year and a half ago um, and um, and those types of projects are um, uh, more, more, more on the clinical focused side. Um, so there's different things being done there um, under uh, Dr. Ron Tompkins. And then uh, Uppsala uh, in Sweden is under uh, Dr. Jonas Burquist, and he's doing both some clinical and molecular uh, studies. And we just started funding him last year. And he's been doing research in MECFS for years, but we're, we're uh, scaling it up and working with him to scale it up and also doing a, a pilot clinical trial with him there. Um, and then in Montreal, uh, we just um, announced that a few months ago that we just started funding and he's doing uh, uh, also some molecular basis of um, MECFS trying to find out what's going on. Um, and, and so they're, they're doing different things, which is why we call it a collaborative. And so uh, they work together. So it's not that it's a center working by itself as a silo and just working by itself. It's really all of everybody working together and talking together and doing different things. And how does that integrate with what the National Institutes of Health is doing? Um, well, uh, at this point, everybody's doing different projects and, you know, we, um, we all follow what each other's doing and, and meet up at conferences and, and have those talks with each other of what people are doing. And, and really, we're all gathering data and, uh, and then really taking a look and researching and looking at all that data, analyzing the data. So hopefully everybody will be sharing their data over time. I mean, right now we're all really in collection mode of all of this data because it's pretty new. Often in science, uh, it's the unexpected that is the breakthrough or the byproduct of some other endeavor. Are we likely to see a breakthrough, a byproduct, a new line of reasoning or thinking come out of the work that's being done on COVID-19? That's a very good question because we, on of, of all the negative things that are happening with COVID-19, one of the positive things is a real look at what will happen to a patient who has this severe infection and how many of these patients are going to develop MECFS and what we can learn along the way. 
So we are Open Medicine Foundation fund, funding a project with all of our centers to collect uh, samples from patients that, are, uh, that survived COVID, uh, that uh, have been in the ICU and out of the ICU and, have, and, and also have, have had COVID, um, uh, to follow them for two years or more and do sampling along the way and see which ones actually survive and, are, and, and end up being well uh, versus what happens uh, to a person who does not get well and develops ME-CFS. We're really hoping to be able to hone in on the pathways that are involved in healing and see which ones might be disrupted in a patient who gets, a person who gets ME-CFS. So I think we're gonna be able to learn a lot from this. Um, we're very excited about that part. Uh, COVID-19 also uh, is partially a disease of the immune system. It's usually the immune system is either compromised, which makes the disease worse, or it results in a compromised immune system. Uh, doesn't that come very close to what you're looking at? Well, the reason that we're interested in looking at it is because so many patients, 75 to 85% of of people who actually come down with ME-CFS say that they had an initiating infection. So since we know this infection, it takes out that variable and then we can actually follow it. So it's not that it's uh, studying the immune system as much as it's following the path and the pathways, including the immune system, of what is going on in a person that uh, makes them uh, continuously chronically ill. So I think it's a lot of a lot of different things that will be looked at, but we're most interested because it's an initiating infection that easily could lead to ME-CFS as other infections have done. While we're shut away in our homes, unable to go out and about, we also get a feeling or an idea or a glimmer into what's it like to have ME and not to be able to go out and about and to be shut away and maybe bedridden. Uh, this is, uh, this is something very interesting, but also very disturbing, because most of us will say after a couple of weeks, if we're healthy people, or now it's more than a month, that we're, you know, a bit stir crazy. It does give us an insight into the suffering or into the dynamics of the suffering of the ME patient. Um, are we learning anything? Are we going to be more sympathetic, more tolerant, less uh, intolerant to people with ME after this? You know, it's a, it, it's a very good question, especially because uh, today happens to be May 12th, which is International Awareness Day. And most important for ME-CFS and fibromyalgia and post-treatment Lyme type diseases is awareness of the community of what is going on with people who are chronically ill. And we're, we're seeing and hoping to see many, many more articles written of all types of how horrible it is for people who are number one sick and quarantined with COVID and, not, and, and just being quarantined so they don't get COVID and relating it to how people with chronic disease live this life every day. Um, so I think it's gonna be bringing out a lot more awareness of this and it will take a lot of different articles and a lot of uh, different important uh, journals and, and papers and, and such for people to realize that some people live this every day and it's uh, uh, eye awakening to people uh, to, to understand that. Um, so I think that part is, is, is very good for awareness. There's a lot of pressure on the charity dollar these days, food banks, other help those stricken by poverty in this time of unemployment and great difficulty, uh, things like uh, Meals on Wheels, etc., Has this affected your fundraising? Our biggest fundraising uh, starts in May and then through the end of the year. So we don't really know how it will impact uh, what we're doing as far as numbers and revenue. Um, but we anticipate it's very difficult because there's so many people out of jobs and out of work. Um, uh, that we might have a, a shortfall this year. However, uh, we have enough funds that we've been funding research and will continue to fund research and will continue to be uh, a, a stable, viable foundation. Uh, we have uh, funding to continue doing that. Um, so we will keep doing what we're doing. Uh, we hope to have additional revenues this year. 
uh, when people realize that many, many more people could develop ME-CFS. So we hope to broaden this out to the community at large and the world at large to understand that this may be something that they see uh, really grow uh, because of COVID-19. So we're hoping for uh, an, an increase in revenue, but we, we anticipate, uh, we, we don't really know what to anticipate actually. I think the message is the sick remain sick. Do not be distracted. Their suffering continues unabated. Correct, correct. And our research will continue in that vein. Uh, have there been any breakthroughs? Any, any idea of where we should go next and when we can expect, say, a biological marker? Is that in the sight? Well, I, I wish I could say yes. You know, we're, we're obviously hoping for breakthroughs, but there has been a lot learned. And so where when, when we all began, uh, we had a needle in a haystack, didn't even know where to look. And there's been a lot of research now that is really focusing on certain areas that researchers are focusing on more now with, uh, you know, with the immune system, with neuroinflammation, with the gut, with, with all different certain metabolomics and, 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 and different genetics. And there's a lot that they're learning that really is helping to focus where the research is headed. And we're trying to look at some pilot studies now um, to focus on some of the targets that are affected. Um, so there's still so much to learn. And I can't say there is a biomarker that is standing out that uh, people are testing right now. Um, but there is a lot of, of uh, uh, results that have been coming out that are are focusing the research in certain areas. So, so that's a really good thing. Linda, I, I do not speak for the community, but I think I can say and reflect their feeling. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. And thank good you. luck to you. All yeah, the thank best. you for what you do. You're helping with awareness all the time. Take care. Cheers. Thank you, thank you so much. Take care too. Bye bye.